Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the June 23rd, 2021 uh, meeting of the Lake Bluff Village Board and PCZBA uh, tonight. Uh, please call the roll. Trustee Inkman. Here. Trustee Brianne. Here. Trustee Fisher. Here. Trustee Marquis. Here. Trustee Rappin. Here. Trustee Ryder. Here. And I'll call the roll for the PCZBA. Uh, Member Danley. Here. Member Fisher. Here. Member Miller. Here. Member Toll. Here via Zoom. And uh, Chair Peters. Here. Next is our non-agenda items and uh, visitors. Of, um, the village president and board of trustees allocate 15 minutes during this item for those individuals who would like the opportunity to address the village board of trustees on any matter not listed on the agenda. Each person addressing the village board, board of trustees is asked to limit their comments to a maximum of five minutes. Any candidate? Nobody's raising their hand on the virtual world either. Okay, we'll proceed. Uh, next is our planned residential development regulations and zoning district review workshop. Great, thank you. Um, just, I know we have a, a 90 minute cap on tonight's meeting and hopefully um, we make the most of that 90 minutes. Um, and to do so, I'm not gonna go back and read the memorandum. Hopefully everybody's had a chance to read the materials in advance of the meeting. And all I'm simply gonna do is introduce our consultant from Tesca, Michael Blue. And then I'm gonna let him uh, have the meeting, uh, the reins of the meeting. Uh, Michael Blue is a principal with Tesca. He spent his time working both in the public and private sectors of planning, which have given him an eccentric perspective <laughs> of the field and how consultants can best serve communities. Uh, prior to working with uh, Tesca Associates back in 2013, um, Michael was a director of community development in Highland Park for 11 years. And he managed department staff of 30 there and worked on a range of planning projects, uh, refined the department's organization and supported the city council and, and commission activities uh, while in Highland Park, Michael managed uh, passage and implementation of the city's affordable housing ordinance. And prior to that, um, he was the deputy community development director for the village of Mount Prospect. Michael? Thank you, Drew. Mayor, Mr. Chair, members of the PCZBA, members of the village board, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight to talk about zoning, right? Everybody? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Since we're all gonna be friends, I'll tell you my dirty little secret. I think zoning is great. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, it, it is uh, zoning in general, the zoning ordinance in particular, and what's, what's not in my eclectic little background there is I do a lot of plan commission training as part of my role of being um, on the, uh, the board of the American Planning Association Illinois chapter. And so we've done over 120 of these. I've probably been half or two thirds of them. So talk to a lot of plan commissions um, and I always tell everybody, I said, look, I want you to go home and hug your zoning ordinance because it's the most misunderstood book in municipal governance because everybody sees it as the big book of no, right? Can I have my fence be in the front? No. Can I have a shed that's right on the front? No, right? And so it's seen as they're just being no. The answer is always no. It's what staff does all day long. They tell people no. I've been at the zoning counter. I've had to tell people what it really is, is it's the book of predictability, right? It lets you know what your neighbor can and cannot do, right? So you know that your neighbor can't build an addition at a certain spot to a certain height that blocks out the sun from your um, garden or your sunroom or your something, right? That kind of predictability protects your property values, protects your enjoyment of your property. It protects you fighting with your neighbors, right? So that's really what zoning is all about, is creating a, a predictability, creating an understanding of how it's gonna work, who's gonna use it, and how it's gonna protect everybody's property values. So I, I ask that we, with, in that spirit, that we, we embark on we're, what we're doing tonight and, and the overall uh, update of, of the PRD. Um, the other lesson, or the other uh, thing to keep in mind um, is that the, the technical aspect of zoning, the writing it, the drafting it, the being very precise about it, um, 
as much fun as it is to write that, it's not as tedious. Um, what's really important, what really makes good zoning is deciding what you as a community want the answer to be. Writing the zoning is actually the easy part. All of that language and where you put the commas and stuff like that, that's easy. Um, what's hard is deciding well, what do we want it to be? What kind of housing? We're talking about who our neighbors are going to be, right? And so that's really what's important. What kind of housing? How is it going to fit into the community? How is it going to represent the community? How is it going to make us feel? How are we going to enjoy it? That's what zoning is all about. And that's why what we're doing tonight is not sitting here talking about where do the commas go in the middle of the paragraphs of the zoning ordinance, right? We're talking about what are our priorities? What is it that we want to see in terms of development for residential uh, in, in the village of Lake Bluff? What is it that, uh, how do we want to go about that process? What do we want, to, okay? That's, which is why as part of your homework, um, we're sections of the village's comprehensive plan, the strategic plan, right? Because that's really what, where this starts. This starts with what do we want the answer to be? And then we'll back into how to get there. Uh, and, and that's why we had you uh, drive around town a little bit um, in, in better weather or better weather, in less covid -y times. We do those things together, put people in vans and drive around, or we do a walking tour if it's of a downtown or a business district. The idea is for you to see town a little bit differently than when you're just driving around. If you're driving to the store, driving your kids around, doing whatever, you're looking, but you're not looking with the eye of somebody who's embarking on this. Right, and the um, the same thought goes for the same thought goes for making those lists and thinking in terms of, oh, gee, you know, I, I know what I like about town, but I never really had to sit and write it down before. So I, I hope you found the the homework and the exercises useful because we're going to make use of them tonight and we're going to build on them and they're going to find their ways into the, the draft of of the uh, the new PRD. So that's my introduction. That's my spiel, and. Was the 90 minutes start from five after or, um, okay. We've, we've timed this to be about 90 minutes. If it's less, that's fine. If it's more and we need to go, you'll just throw something at me and, and I'll, uh, I'll stop talking, but that's the way it works. So let's start with those, with, with those lists of things that you like best, whether you've got it written down in front of you or whether you had it in your head. Uh, what we're going to do is let's start with that because that's ultimately where we want to get to. So we thought that would be a, a great place to start. And I'll take notes here on this pad that uh, I'm sure not all of you can see, but Glenn has been kind enough to uh, also uh, be a scribe and the words will appear magically in, in front of us on the screen. I have no idea how this stuff works. So, um, you know, I guess the only fair thing to do is to, to pick a spot and just start going around. So, Christine, can I ask you to start? Sure, sure. Um, so when I, when I looked at how I would interpret just going around the village and, and understanding what I feel that um, our, our duty is, is to, no matter what we do, include things that are welcoming and connected um, and, and who, that, that fit into our strategic plan, but also ask the question, what's missing? So um, when we look at Lake Bluff and the wonderful things about it, we also need to ask the question, what is missing from Lake Bluff? And I'll briefly end with that. Okay, great. So let's go around. If anybody, everybody could share that first list that we asked you to make about um, what are the things that you really like, and we will also get to what's missing. Maybe we can just keep going. Everybody can share a couple of those. Sure. Um, I've always liked the fact that the scale of Lake Bluff, both in the central business district and, and the housing stock is small. And it makes the town feel intimate because we do not have any uh, buildings that exceed uh, two stories. So we have a, when you either drive through, walk through or ride your bike through town, you feel as though you're in something that doesn't soar above you. You, you're, you can relate to it because visually it's at the same level, more or less as eye level, you, you know, and when, it gets too high, you feel like you're in a canyon and that's happening in suburbs all over, but it's not happened here, which I think is lovely. And it incorporates also the natural elements that make Lake Bluff so special. Great, excellent, excellent. So I, I think um, nature 
and the greenery of Lake Bluff is not just myself, but I think it's echoed in our strategic plan and throughout uh, village community members. There's lots of access to beautiful nature, but also all of the, the different neighborhoods have mature trees, have beautiful landscaping. Um, there, each, each community or each uh, neighborhood varies <coughs> from, from location to location, but it is all tied together with um, excellent greenery. I, I think that's up there highly on my list. Also, the community is really walkable or bikeable. Even when you get into, you know, west of Green Bay, there's a bike path that you can easily get to and ride into town all the way to the bike or to the beach. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, but those are the top two things that come to mind for me. Great. Thank you. Mayor? I have five items. Um, no, I think that I'm also European and I, I, I grew up in older uh, communities. Uh, my parents' house was 600 years when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a new construction. Everything else was about 200 <laughs> years. Uh, I'm half kidding. Uh, so what I like is the non-uniform aspect. It is planned for an unplanned mix. There is basically, I did not move to Pleasantville. Okay, it is, we live in a, in a mixed environment. Uh, talking about that, mixed housing, uh, having all different types of it's a community. It takes a village to create the village of Lake Bluff, literally. I said trees, uh, it needs to be green. Uh, we are a tree community and we really need to cherish that. Um, the, what is important to me is, and that is reflected by my kids and many other kids in the city, is the kids feeling free to run wild in the neighborhood. That's what I, I wrote, but it's a certain spirit. I, I moved here because people were saying hi in the street and smiling in the street. If we don't smile, what is, not, what is not to be happy about what is happening to us? And that is reflected in the way we design our community. And the last item is proximity to the lake and to the water. Not too much water, not too much flowers, but just the lake, okay. Yes, thank you, sir. So I think we're going to start repeating a lot of things. <laughs> That's, we, we planners call that consensus. That's good. Uh, That's not right. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing that I had on my list were um, trees, trees, landscaping, natural look and feel. So I love the, the greenness of Lake Bluff and all the open space and the fact that um, we just have a lot of nature around us. Um, Different home styles with different types of materials. I think that makes for just more interesting homes. It makes for a more interesting community, more character. Um, I love the fact that we have so many multi-generational neighborhoods, meaning that across my street, I have an 85-year-old neighbor. Behind me, I have someone with a child who's two. Like, I love that. Um, and then um, kind of following up on what Regis was saying, kids running freely. Uh, I love the idea of neighborhood connectivity. So. If I live in North Terrace, I have a little walking path that can get me into Tangley Oaks and I can access Tangley Oaks and walk the paths in there and enjoy that neighborhood as they can come into my neighborhood and use my neighborhood as well. And there's paths for children to ride bikes and, and move around easily without always having to drive, drive people everywhere. And those would be my, that's my list. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> uh, what Joy said. <laughs> um, I'll just put it in my own words. Um, I think the, <laughs> The essence of Lake Bluff, we have different places to live. We have the east side, which is kind of the grids. Uh, and then we have Tangley Oaks, or, or if it's Bella Foray, or some of the other developments with winding roads. Doesn't really matter, but there is an element of charm in nature, uh, which has already been said. But to me, with, with, there are very different styles, but they all have this kind of spirit of nature and beauty. So that's really important to me. I think what Joy said about not being cookie cutter, um, this is not a place for an Edward Scissorhands type uh, in place with, you know, tons of townhomes in a row. It's, it's really the uniqueness of the types of houses that give this town charm. So that would be important to me. Uh, leveraging, you know, open spaces. I think there's a number of our developments that leverage open, open spaces and really are public assets. And so the more that we can, can have that, the better it is for our, our community. Uh, and then I think somebody also talked about the uh, connectivity uh, about being able to 
whether it's biking or walking or simply entering and exiting uh, a, a housing development being connected to Lake Road. So I'll stop there. I'm trying to think of something unique to say. Um, I, I would tell you though that everybody who has said I've, it's already been said said it a little different. Else. Said right. something else, right. <laughs> something a little differently. So don't don't slow down just because uh, you might have heard something I, before. I wrote down but didn't bring with me um, <laughs> a list that included the difference in higher housing styles. Um, and some someone has mentioned that, but one comment that I get from newcomers, my family that comes in, friends that come in, is how beautiful the neighborhoods are because they aren't you know, identical one after another. In addition though, we also are fortunate enough to have sanctuary or part of our, um, of our community. And so we are able to have a little bit more um, variety that that provides. Um, and, and so we have sort of a little bit of everything um, except, <laughs> except uh, multifamily units, which we probably might, might need to get to. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that it's um, perfectly imperfect. It's, um, it's got a North Shore feel with sort of a laid back style. You know, um, the, the park across from my house, which is not our responsibility, but it doesn't, you know, look pristine all times of year. It looks like a park that people can use. Um, so I think there's something beautiful about that, that we all have a little bit of a, of a more laid back view of what perfect looks like. Excellent. Anybody else from the, the board? Yes. I, um, I really enjoy the beach. I know we talked about the lake in general, but the beach I think is the jewel of the village. Um, the yacht club that's down there, just how um, you can see everyone every weekend that go down there and everyone congregates during COVID. We even try to accommodate it. It was great. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Chair, you kick us off. Uh, safety. Excuse me, safety community. Community pride. Beach. Relatively low volume of traffic for pedestrians. Increasingly vibrant downtown and relatively low density neighborhood. Treat funds, the only one's going to be able to read my writing. Please. Changes 
and I'm going to hit the snowmobile commercial in that apartment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You were talking homogenous. about homogenous. Yeah, we're very mm -hmm. homogenous people. We're different religions, we're different ages, we're different aspects of our life. But we're, we're we're North Shore, <laughs> and I think that is one of the key aspects of doing a CRD, where if we break that homogeneity, people, <laughs> and I think that's going to be our challenge. <clears throat> Like a stone bridge, we call it be nice home for this million dollars. Some people will complain, but most people say, Yeah, we can live with it. But if it's going to be a housing community, um, moderate income, maybe just low income housing, or senior housing, or three stories, if that should ever happen, community may go up in arms. And I think for going forward, I mean, in my mind, the most important aspect that we have to deal with. Excellent. Um, I have a question when describing like how the job gets a lot of connected. Um, so a lot of our conditions are with the topic um, downtown road because it keeps us not necessarily I meant the village spirit and spirits because we have um, we have a you know brewery and wine and walking together and very loving each other and we share that together. I think that's really a wonderful um, I mentioned sidewalks. You know, there's so many downtowns and communities that don't have sidewalks. And I think that you know driving around and walking. Can I can I interject one thing? It just for for the PCZB PCZBA members, when you're speaking, can you grab the microphone? I, I got somebody noted that it's hard to hear just when those folks are talking, and that's that's not your fault. That's just ours. We should have known that, and we we tested it earlier. But great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have there. members on Zoom, right? Okay. Yes. So I think uh, I think I'm, I believe I'm the only one. This is Aaron Toll. Um, you know, having grown up in Lake Bluff, uh, been one of those kids riding their bikes all around town from every neighborhood to the next. Uh, that was one of the big things that that brought my wife and I back to Lake Bluff is having the ability to just not worry about our kids when they're out and about. Um, so having having low speed traffic, having sidewalks, having connectivity between neighborhoods, um, those are all incredibly important things, uh, to, especially to keep young families for, um, interested in coming to Lake Bluff. And, um, and I really think that's, of course, who we market to the most, right, is, is when we're so, trying to sell our homes is those young families that are coming into town. Additionally, of course, the, the proximity to the lake is, is a huge bonus. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that's what brought my parents into Lake Bluff uh, when they moved in in 1989. Uh, that you know, We had the choice between, my wife grew up in the western suburbs, 
on uh, a, a community very similar to Lake Bluff. And I brought her up to visit Lake Bluff and, and she saw the lake and she said, all right, this is it. Um, so we had, we had options, but uh, you know, that really drew us um, to, to the village. And since we've been back here for uh, the, the last number of years, um, one of the things that we've really come to appreciate is the opportunities for spontaneous socialization. So we'll sit out on our front, front step or you know, walk around town. We see tons of people we know um, and we stop, they stop by for you know, 10 minutes, half hour or, or longer. And it's just a really special connection that, um, it, it just re really builds the community. So I think uh, opportunities for, for that kind of spontaneity is, is really key as well. Excellent, thank you. Are, are there any members from the audience who are here who'd like to add something or, or echo some of the things that they heard here that they'd like to share that are special to them about the village? Thank you. Anything? I just would reaffirm that I love the street space, the community, all the parks, the walkability, and just the farm and the different places. So we sort of I, you also have two in the virtual world who may want to comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Any of the residents that are uh, virtually with us by Zoom care to share anything? I know as soon as I start talking, someone will say something. <laughs> okay, well, there'll be opportunities to share again later. Thank you all very much. Um, so I had this great idea that we'd go back through the list and we'd vote. <laughs> <laughs> um, because what we've done is what I've been writing here, what Glenn's been tracking, has done sort of a, a, a tallying by itself. This is very much akin to the rank choice voting that they were doing in New York. So this is, this is spot on target. But I would ask a question uh, as we move through this. As you listen to what you heard your fellow um, residents say, was there anything that you thought, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that? What was it that you heard from somebody else that wasn't on your list that you thought, oh, I don't wish I'd written that one down? Because I know I always do that. Would anybody like to share one of those just to kind of as a way of adding emphasis to some of the things that we're looking at here? And yeah, Glenn's scrolling through them now just, just as a, a reminder. But did you hear something? Yeah. I'll mention that our community member who highlighted that we're a small village, but we have an excellent, superb fire department in police department of our own. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed that that wasn't originally on my list because it is something that's highly valued. Great. That's why we group source this stuff. Please. <laughs> I, I think for me, um, safety in the lake, I, I kind of, I guess, take those for granted. Cause I, I mean, I was thinking more of like, when I'm looking at a neighborhood, what, what, you know, I was thinking more from a zoning standpoint, but um, truly, probably one of the first things I say to people when I tell them about Lake Bluff is how beautiful the lake is and how lucky I am to be living there. And my kids are running around all the time just on their own. So safety is always top of mind, but I think it's not something that I really worry about. So those two things I would say, but were not on my list that probably should have been there. Okay, great. Anybody else here? Something that in some version that they uh, that they didn't think of when they first wrote that list that jumped out them jumped out at them as they heard one of your uh, fellow residents sit, list it. I'll say that I think it was Joy. Oh my goodness! Um, I think what Joy, what you mentioned about connectivity, you know, the the ability to connect the neighborhoods and 
maybe that needs to go back to what's missing is perhaps we need to find a way to make those parts really connect that you can take a bike or walk and whether it's a sidewalk or a path. But that to me made me realize when I was driving around that I hadn't thought of that connecting part and how do we really bring our community and village together that way. So that was, that, that made me think. Excellent. Okay. And Bill, I, you know, the safety part and the connectivity to me boils down to kind of what Aaron said, which is not worry about the kids. Um, that's like the filter. If you don't want to worry about the kids, you have to have things connected. You have to have things safe. Uh, and, and man, that's desirable and very marketable. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Last call. Anybody else? Well, I think we ought to just emphasize the existence of the bike trails. I think that's a tremendous asset. I mean, we'll make reference to it, but it is a tremendous asset, I believe. There is one thing we did not mention, but please, uh, we are a beach community. We were built, we were created as a community oriented toward being a summer camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is prevalent, that is, uh, that is embedded into how we are as a community. And I don't think I've seen that, uh, that present we, are a bit, we, we have a lake, great, but we are a beach community. Yeah, okay. Excellent. All right, so, let, so now I hear all of you asking, but Michael, how does all this turn into zoning? Right? I mean, I think that's a fair question. Um, when, you, when you went through and, and read the zoning ordinance, one of the things that, that you might have seen um, as you, you went through the code um, was the purpose statement. Good zoning ordinances always have a purpose statement. So the purpose statement serves uh, a, a lot of functions. Um, one, when you as a PC, ZBA, or you as a village board are, are looking at um, a proposed development, when you're using this or this section of the ordinance, um, it, should, it should match the purpose statement. And I kind of figured we'd have it up here, but I'm gonna pass them around and share if you wanna look at it or Draw little animals on them. You're certainly welcome to do that. But the, the purpose statement is really what says, why are we doing this? And it's useful, as I was saying, when you're dealing with a development that's part, and I didn't bring it up for everybody. So if you could pass them down a little bit and share, and it's right up here anyway. So I apologize for, for not thinking of bringing up for everybody. Um, when, when somebody reads the zoning ordinance, because they're gonna come before you with a development, they should be looking at this too. Um, when there is, unfortunately it happens, litigation that relates to developments. This is part of the first thing that Peter and his team looks at is what is the purpose statement? What has been established by our zoning ordinance to say, who are we and what does this code do and how is, how is this section of the code going to uh, gonna help us get there? So. I'm not so much looking for us to rewrite the purpose statement right here. We'll do that later and sh share with you what we have. But I thought it would be interesting to have this discussion once we've made our list, have the discussion now in the context of the, of the statement. And for, for me to, to ask you, given the list we all just made, read these statements and tell me, is this a good summary? of what we just talked about? Are there ideas in this statement that are really very important that we have to be sure and preserve? Uh, are there things that are just wildly missing? Right. So think of this in terms of how you're explaining it, because this is what the ordinance needs to do. You're explaining to the developer who's coming with the code, um, all the things we just stood here and spent half an hour listing. And you got you know four, six, half a dozen, whatever statements to do it. And so just as an exercise of thinking it through, do these do it? And if they do, what about that stands out as being, yeah, that's spot on. And, and what about that is missing? Do you want us to share now? Yeah, yeah. I, have a, I probably have a comment about that from that list because I stopped when I was reading, but I stopped on it. Missing from that list is the human element, the human factor, the human factor, the human, factor, the ah. human element. The one of my comments was uh, kids running the street. Okay, that's not there. This is what motivated the kids running the street and loving our community is not here. 
uh, the, the second thing is when I look at Tangley Oaks, and I lived in Tangley Oaks, Armour Woods, East and West Terrace, North Terrace, the East Side, they are actually not the same communities. They, they, there were experiments going in those, and they're actually different. Uh, there was a different intent, and what makes cohesion in our community? And I think the cohesion part is important. Somebody said uh, uh, homogeneous. I don't have a sense of homogeneous when I go when I drive around, but that still makes us a community. Would be my comments. Excellent, thank you. Somebody else want to suggest? Can I clarify that? homogeneous. I'm sorry. Can I clarify homogeneous. Homogeneous in socioeconomic terms, okay. not in buildings, not in parks or anything like that, but we're all very similar in socioeconomic terms. And I think that's what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. From my standpoint, maybe there's something missing about the connectivity and the creating, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the part of a holistic community Mm -hmm. So adding somehow to the greater or broader community or being connected in some way to the greater broader community. Say that again about adding. Well, I don't remember. <laughs> I was listening, but I was writing at the same time. Yeah. You were talking about the connectivity and the holistic characteristics of the village and the development. Con should contributing, add to that. Con being basically being a holistic part of the broader community. I think that goes to what Joy was saying. Um, she and I live down the street from each other and there is a path cut through um, to Tangley Oaks, which to me is sort of the gold standard of a development. If anything can look like that, it should. Uh, but you make a really good point that it's easy to walk in and walk through that space and not feel as though you've left our neighborhood and gone to some other, you just sort of, it, it naturally flows. So if we use the, the possibility of a development in Stonebridge that how do we connect that to the West Terrace so that there's an uninterrupted feeling even if the housing stock is different, which it certainly probably will be. Uh, versus Belfort A, which even though there's a, a bike path along Green Bay Road, it's somewhat disconnected from anything else. Uh, and yet it's a, it's a development. So it, it, some of it is just geographic. Where does it fall on one side of Green Bay Road or the other, one side of the railroad tracks or the other? But I think Joy's point is excellent, is that in order to get that cohesion that you're talking about, you have to actually have physical uh, connectedness so that you don't have any physical barriers for bicycle or uh, pedestrian traffic. <laughs> we focus really so point. much on vehicular traffic and, and we aren't talking, mm -hmm. I think when we talk about planned development, so that would be something to add uh, is to facilitate um, pedestrian and bicycle traffic to create a cohesive and uh, connected uh, I don't want to say feeling because that's too ephemeral, but literal, make it literal. And you make a very good point, which is not all connections are the same. Some of them are inherently more different, but more difficult, right? And some of them are inherently more important because they relate to safety as opposed to just getting around. Correct. So in, a, in, in the case of Stonebridge, we might speak of ingress and egress for emergency vehicles, but are we talking about daily use, like walking and and... Uh, cycling. Okay, excellent. I have Peter. Oh no, oh, trustees go. <laughs> trustees first. I have a comment about preserving the natural scenic qualities of open spaces. We don't we don't have a lot of open spaces, but certainly there are a few notable open spaces. And how do we, um, by putting in the zoning ordinance, the purpose is to preserve it. How much are we are we limiting? How much are we? How how much is enough of open mm. space? And so, I think that's a big question. How much is enough? How much is, of anything is enough, right? How much? 
connectivity is enough. And I, I, I love and I value connectivity. I live in the sanctuary, which is very connected within itself. It's 177 homes, but it is the farthest uh, west. It is not um, easy necessarily to bike or walk, although it can be done. Um, but there's also value in having that little bubble. So we aren't part of the broader Lake Bluff bubble, but I really enjoyed knowing that you know, my, my kids were in that bubble. They weren't gonna cross Waukegan Road and they weren't gonna go all the way over here. So I, I do agree that it's important to have connectivity, but you can have different kinds of connectivity and different kinds of bubbles, just like we could have a development that doesn't look like any other development before and have it be cohesive within itself and provide something that we don't already have and it would be okay. It doesn't look like this and it doesn't look like that, but it's beautiful and lovely and fits um, the goal of perhaps providing something that is missing. As long as it makes sense within itself and is connected to others as much as is possible, I think that it can be a beautiful thing and part of a complement to what may be missing. So I guess you to dig a little deeper into that and, and for the rest of the group too, just the way we said, not all connections are the same, not all open spaces are the same, right? I live in Lake County too, we love our forest preserves, right? But we're not talking about every development having its own forest preserve, right? So maybe I get you and, and the group too to chime in on the idea of when we talk about open space, mm -hmm. to what extent are we talking about, we love our forest preserve or we love our little pocket park that's near our house and everything in between? Well, I think that we do have a lot of different public spaces. Some are actually part of the park district. Um, I live in the sanctuary and a lot of it is open homeowner association land. And there's, there's kind of bogs and creeks and, you know, a little bit of forest and then it's connected to the park. And, and, and that's not really, it's kind of unique in the way that that is all laid out. Just like Tangley Oaks is very unique. And I think there's a place for all of it. Hmm. And I, and maybe we haven't quite developed what, the next version of that looks like. Uh, please. Yeah, so I just I just wanted to follow up on the on the open spaces. Um, so one of the things I noticed when I was reading through the the uh, the PRD was that um, it seems like a lot of the new um, neighborhoods will have homeowners associations because they will have open space and what have you. And so what I actually noticed during COVID was um, <clears throat> a lot of the kids during COVID, they couldn't do a lot of things. So they wanted to fish. They wanted to go fishing because they could, because they could be socially distanced. Yeah. Well, if they went into Tangley Oaks, all those ponds are posted private property, what have you. If they went into Armour Woods, private property, you can't fish here. And I was kind of thinking to myself, boy, it would be really nice if we had open spaces that more people could access, not just the people living in that neighborhood. And I know they're funding, they're, they're paying for the upkeep on that, but maybe there's a way that we could, um, we could come to a compromise where um, some of those open spaces can be utilized by more people in the community than just the, just the people in the neighborhood. That's a great question. It's a great zoning question, right, too, because when somebody comes before you and they want to they have something or have something a little different, right, the logical and appropriate question to ask is, how are we going to maintain that? And then for the association to say, well, you know what, we'll take care of it. Well, then it's a logical answer to go, yep, great. It's yours, you take care of it. But there's there's a price to that is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, great. Anybody else about open space or the right kind of open space or the wrong kind of open space or what I took from your note and what I, what I wrote down is that the open space needs to be right for the area. Right. Kind of depends where you are. Right, and, and I do, I mean, living within a homeowners association, I often think, is it good or is it not good that we're part of a homeowners association because Homeowners Association uh, is not going to have that longer term vision that by definition a village will because the village has right. been around for 100 plus years and the Homeowners Association hasn't and the Homeowners Association is looking at well, what are the monthly fees and the village has a broader base it has a broader it has a broader everything and so do we take some of that that um, I don't know stewardship of, of land and other things that associations are have been taking over, you know, in recent developments, and have it as our goal to have it not include as much for the association or whatever that entity is. Should should it be our goal to have it more? Is this part of the park district? Is this part of village maintained 
right of way? You know, it's it's a good question to ask. Okay. Anybody else about open space? I'll tell you when we moved to our neighborhood that has a homeowners association and we <coughs> looked at the house in June and July and there was lovely open space, which we learned the next spring was also the huge stormwater detention area that you couldn't use until June or July. So, oh, you know, live and learn. Um, <laughs> anything else about, about open space, either um, from the, the virtual audience or, or anybody who's here? We're, we're doing great. We're covering a lot of ground. I'm going to move us along just to make sure we get through all of the questions I have, but please, if you got something. I have something related to, to A, it's not open spaces, but please to, to me, it's a little bit, um, and I don't want to wordsmith, but it's a little bit narrow in, in its intent, which is to preserve the natural scenic qualities of open spaces. But I heard a lot of people talking about nature in general and the idea of encouraging a natural aesthetic in whatever is developed, um, which I think broadens it a little. Michael, I think it begs the question, how is it preserved? What, what instrument is used to preserve it? Is it a conservation easement? Is it a park area? And to Steve's point, um, what is the definition of open space? And, and the reason I'm, I'm poking at this, there's no secrets here. There's no, you know, there's no trick questions. The question, because part of a plan development, part of a PUD, no matter where you are, is about how do you deal with the open space? How do you provide it? How do you make the development special through the open space? So that's, that's why I'm, I'm poking at this a little more. So this is all very useful. And I appreciate you helping me think it through. I might have a follow up on the open space. Uh, we have an ordinance for no more than six inches or eight inches of grass. Are we talking of, uh, about grassland or are we and manicured or are we talking about natural plantings and natural prairie type that's why i asked that question because in landscaping open space means one thing to one person and something else you know it might mean like a golf course that's open space that's highly manicured and heavily uh, fertilized versus natural occurring open space that may be maintained like the corner of Green Bay Road. Right. And one so think of, what we're, think of what we're setting up here. Next time a developer has the pleasure of coming before you and talks about open space, you all know to say, what kind of open space are you talking about? Is it going to be native plantings? Are they going to be considered weeds by the neighbors? Is it going to be something that the kids can use? It can be stormwater management so Michael can't use it, right? That's what the, that's what the code is going to help lay out for all those questions. Yeah. Sorry, Jill. Thank you. I was just going back down to D and I think I'm circling back to the human factor because when you say which will be most advantageous to the village, I think the big question mark is how when we are a village with such different views and the human factor <laughs> is our challenge in our village, right? To move anything forward with a vision of our village is more than just a few disrupted people. And I think that's our biggest challenge is our human factor, whether it's open lands or development. And I know we'll get into it in another thing, but that's something back to human factor. I want you to all take note of the fact that I'm carefully watching the clock. Um, but this is all very helpful and I, I hope it's, it's of value to you too, just in terms of what we're gonna be doing moving forward. I just wrote most advantageous or relating it to, um, to number, was it number D, letter D. So let's let's dig it a little deeper into these. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary, was there someone? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, from the the virtual world or our, our neighbors here, anybody want to share anything about open space? Oh, Peter had something. Not on open space. How can That's I why I was waiting. Peter, for you. no. Anything you have to add? Please. No, no, no. So I thought. I'm sorry. I have to apologize. Peter and I worked together in Hemel Park. I've known him for decades. I don't want you to think I'm treating him disrespectfully. I love seeing him here. So thank <laughs> you. I'm just joking with him. And likewise. What do you want? Um, <laughs> So two things about, I, I do think those standards are, um, they're pretty narrow. So the list can definitely grow. Um, but the two things I noticed that aren't on there are one, and we started to get into it a little bit, is impact on other, on surrounding properties. Um, just generally, whether it's, you know, the connectivity issue or the types of housing or the road network or utilities or whatever it may be especially for a PRD, 
there's all sorts of opportunities to um, mitigate any impacts mm -hmm. and address them. The other thing is um, historic structures and landscapes. Um, the village um, prides itself on those things, and <laughs> they're and they're um, and they're present in a lot of different. I would say they're probably going to be present in one way or another in any kind of property that's going to qualify for a PRD. Um, so addressing those things um, seems important. Excellent. And can we just for helping the conversation, Glenn? Can you bring up that exhibit really quick? And I heard Stonebridge mentioned a couple of times. You mentioned the sanctuary, which um, what I wanted to do is share this visual aid with everyone. This is a kind of a simple exhibit that shows the number of properties that meet the current minimum acreage for a PRD, which is six acres, which is not super large, right? When you think about it, but um, it, it's I think the number that we just we just quickly did this this afternoon. I think it was at seven properties. And um, if you look at them, I mean, there's, I mean, Stonebridge is one of the larger ones at 47 plus acres, but there's several other, um, like to the north there on Green Bay Road, that's, you know, uh, kind of sandwiching the uh, existing PRD and across the street from other PRDs. And, um, and there's some areas on the east side that could make sense for a PRD tool as well. So just to let you know that this, this tool is something that doesn't get used a lot. Right, so this is a chance for us to sharpen it, and that's what this is conversation is all about. Make it better for the next time we need these. That was it. <coughs> so I'd I'd like you to, to to go back to the go to your second list that we we talked about about the characteristics of of good development, and I'd like to to look at them in terms of some of the the keywords that are. Uh, That are, that are in the purpose statement here, right? So one of them is, um, and what I'd like you to do is in looking at what you've got in front of you for what are your characteristics of, new de of, of uh, good development, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick out some phrases here and I'd, I'd like you to help define them. So the first one is, and Glenn's not to pass it out, I'll get you to just write this right under it, right? Um, harmonious variety of architectural styles. So um, so that's right in there. Took that right out of the statement somewhere. Seems pretty important. So I pulled it out. There you go. Um, so so based, on, based on your second list of what are the characteristics of good development, what does this mean? Please. I likened it to a patchwork quilt. And so when we look at different developments, you know, Tangley makes sense within Tangley and we can have other patches in the quilt that, that kind of makes sense. And sometimes those patches get repeated, but um, patchwork quilts are beautiful. That's a, that's a great analogy. Thank you. And it, it kind of circles back to what many of us have talked about, which is we're not Pleasantville. We're not Edward Scissorhands. We're not a, the kind... <laughs> We don't have a development that repeats exactly the same layout uh, and, uh, and appearance uh, throughout the development. So even with the sanctuary has similar architecture. It's pretty, pretty close. It's close, honest. but it's not exact. And, I mean, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't ring that way when I spent time there. And I think that it, it, that is valued in this community. So I think it's a pretty perfect way of articulating that desire. Okay, great. Um, wait, 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 wait. Thank you. Okay. I guess uh, the question that I have is the one phrase that I hear a lot from people who are moving here is eclectic. And eclectic and harmonious to me are kind of at odds, you know, at least on the spectrum or something. So I don't know if it's I understand the intent of the patchwork quilt and you know that's very much that I just don't know that harmonious captures that as well as maybe some other word I don't know in the future that kind of allows for all the variety that we have that when it's assembled together works wonderfully but it can be pretty you know I I know that some people come here and find it jarring kind of the 
big house next to the small house next to the mm. this and that and they're just not this isn't necessarily the community for them but um we do have those options when you look at different neighborhoods but anyway i just to me it's a little bit different than harmonious so first of all the reason Give me a second. oh maybe, please maybe we can get rid of the word harmonious and just leave the rest of the statement doesn't harmonious re relate back to the word within mm -hmm. it's harmonious within it if you take out elliot the just to provide a harmonious variety within the development that's the the the, the important part mm -hmm. it's that, harmonious within so should that harmonious so it makes sense because you can have harmony and tangly and the houses don't look the same an excellent observation However, Those... armor woods the houses are all their duplexes they're more or less all the same yet they're harmonious with the natural environment so harmony is relative term but it's harmony within that's as correct. opposed How... to harmony without so Deb's right when you go through the single family of old because you're integrating split level with camp meeting next to the two homes that were built on center where they're used to in the 300 block where mm -hmm. when we trick or treat we used to run by it. <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> haunted house so i also have lived here for a really long time and i can talk about what it felt like to be a kid running wild and snowmobiling um, so that's a great point. I want to summarize for the group and see if, see if I'm getting this right. I think that's a terrific point that um, harmonious here means an internal consistency. Does it also mean that there needs to be some sort of connection or harmoniousness to the rest of the village somewhere, somehow? Sure. I mean, harmony implies with, to Deb's point, with the community as a whole. This is really a drafting issue, I think, because it's taking Lake Bluff as a whole and the nature of its architecture, and yet within the development itself, because we also have to think of what is a developer's aim and, and ability, but I think you can strike a balance between the two where you're asking them to uh, be aware of Lake Bluff generally while creating a level of interest, not homogeneity of development um, style you know, housing type, a heterogeneity, but that that is still harmonious. Yeah, it Adelaide. struck me that harmonious variety was a little bit of an oxymoron too. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why. I but again, it, it relates to the word within. Exactly. Mayor? I, mean, I would like to agree with you, and I think I do agree with you, but when I think about the style, we have Swiss chalet, we have mm -hmm. uh, 1980 uh, Norwegian style, we have Norwegian mo modern somewhere else, we have uh, Tudor style, and we have uh, on going on which would we have a cathedral style because we have that style and everything else in between so right. the, the non-uniform uniform is actually what we have sure i live in my house is the only one like it in town so i know what that what you're talking about it may you're right but for a for a planned residential development i don't know if we could pull that off can you add landscaping to that sentence sure please I, I think for me, there's a little bit, uh, there's an underlying understanding in that statement that the quality of the homes will be harmonious. Mm -hmm. So part of the idea when I read that statement is that um, the, the quality will be similar. And I Design think- Design materials, all the above. Uh, ju yeah, just that, um, Within I don't PRD? know. I don't know how to quantify it. Okay. You mean within the PRD? Yeah, like that. That you're you and and within the community as well. That I I I, mm -hmm. I do recall. I think it was a while ago that um, there were spec homes being built. People were concerned that the, the quality of the homes wasn't wasn't um, didn't fit within the village. I don't. I'm not sure how to actually say that without saying no, you know what? people yeah. were building cheap homes. So I had that down. I said. A good residential development, it seems that it's been approved upon when an architect was involved versus a spec home. Right. So what does that really mean? It seems like there was a time when there were spec homes versus getting an architect and a homeowner to invest in the community. Right. Maybe that's the ebb and flow of real estate and, and recession or yeah. whatever else that you can afford that. But there's a big difference when that happened. And then I'd but like to just say harmonious is a subjective word. I feel that I don't really feel that that's a complimentary word. I think harmonious could be a safe haven that we may want to feel 
I still want to feel vibrant. I want this town to be vibrant and growth. And harmonious to me indicates sort of a one level, one layer. And I okay. feel like we're multi dynamic. Let me ask quickly if there's any of the neighbors that are here or anybody uh, on Zoom that would like to add anything about harmonious. And then in time, I'm going to move you along. This is this is a great conversation. I appreciate it, but just want to keep us moving. Anybody Can else? I just add one phrase. Can we call it a planned residential community that does not look like a planned residential? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the goal. That's kind of the goal. That's the whole, that's the whole thing in a nutshell, right? Right, yeah. Let me go to the next phrase because it, it's got a few questions that I'd like to hear what you think about. So the other phrase that's in there is creative and imaginative design, right? So that's part of what part of what the village is looking for. It's perfectly reasonable. What what does it mean here? Create and so you can look at your list, and maybe that'll help you when you think about what what makes good development here. But so we're specifically saying, okay. Madam developer, when you come through here, we want you to be creative and imaginative in your design. Now that's got to have some bounds in it or heaven only knows what we're going to get. Um, what are those bounds? What, what, are, what do you think of when you want to see something creative and imaginative? Houses on stilts, houses made of cheese, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it represents what people of like love. As in, um, we're all different. We're all having wildly different ideas. And we all wildly different. Uh, we all wildly uh, disagree with each other. You guys can attest of that. And our housing stock uh, represents that uh, that uh, that different thinking. And you guys normalize that. Good luck. But maybe this is the spirit of like buff. We talk about spirit. Very nice. We try normalizing that. You know, so what does creative and imaginative design mean? Or what are the bounds of it, I guess, is what I'm really interested in. Well, when I look at that, I'm not thinking about um, form as much as function, because I think that we have some needs that haven't been addressed. And so how can we creatively address some of the needs that haven't been addressed? And that means how do we make something um, maybe more affordable by either being smaller or more accessible by being more friendly to older people, which everyone in this room, we're gonna be one of those <laughs> if we're lucky. So I want you to really think about that, it's super important. Um, and those are the kinds of questions I think we really need something imaginative and creative because individually it's not happening. It's not, it's not happening by this and that, you know, it, it's, it's not happening. So unless we as a larger body help to create that fertile ground and foster it in some way, it hasn't happened yet and it's probably not gonna happen very easily, so. I, I love that point, Barbara, because this has to mean something other than architecture. Yes. And, and because that's dealt with in the preceding bullet. Um, and it is, I think you've hit on something because it's not being developed. It can't. It, much of what we're uh, talking about in the variety of the housing can't be <coughs> accomplished through traditional zoning. And the purpose of this is not to articulate the purpose behind zoning. It's the purpose behind this kind of exception to the other otherwise existing zoning. And so I think we could draw that out more than we've done in C, but I think ex that's exactly right. Those are great. Anybody else? I'll just make one comment on that. I think um, I think the key part of that is that you know, as much as we like to think that our zoning regulations are always up to date and always uh, match the market, occasionally that's not the case, right? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, um, we, we may not be uh, perfectly up to date on, on everything. So this allows for creative people to come to us with those ideas that, um, that might fit, fit those needs uh, that our, our current zoning doesn't, doesn't allow for. So um, it's bringing more smart people into the room to, uh, 
to, to, to make what's best for the village. Excellent, thank you. I think the price, well, the, the price of land in Lake Bluff becomes, in my mind, prohibitive to do any kind of housing that's affordable. You can see that in block three. I mean, the land is so expensive, nobody wants to build on it because they can't get their investment back within the two, two, two story frame. And I think any property like Stonebridge, it's very costly. I think it's going to have to be very, somebody's going to have to be very creative to put a plan in place that works within the, the boundaries of the cost of land in this village. I don't know if that exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess just to add on that, and I, I don't know that this is the right actual forum for that, but I was, as I was reading through and I was thinking about things and, and just what, I'm sorry, Elliot, oh, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Miller was saying, um, you know, it might really benefit us when we're looking at these PRDs to try and find developers that <clears throat> have, um, have quite a bit of experience, have a little more experience and have um, a better understanding of using smaller pieces of land for the PRDs. Cause I feel like the pieces of land that we have in Lake Bluff, I, 47 acres is big, but it's not, um, it's not uh, huge by any stretch of the imagination. So the, the developer is going to have to have some level of creativity and experience to come in and be able to create something that will not only financially work for the village, for the developer, for our community, what have you, but, um, mm -hmm. but also be able to um, build something that works for, for the community. I'm going to use that as a transition to the next phrase because that's that's perfect because this question about how do you deal with smaller sites is just absolutely essential uh, in built up communities and smaller communities, no doubt. So the other the last phrase in there that I want to spend a couple minutes talking about is greater flexibility. Right. And I would go back to the um, to, to the map that Glenn put up before that showed all those, all those six acre sites. Um, it, it is not canon that PRDs have to be six acres. A lot of towns have got a 10 acre minimum. A lot of towns have got a 20 acre minimum. A lot of towns have no minimums for planned developments of any sort. So we all get used to what's in our code and we all like, oh, PRD has got to be six acres. Yep, okay, got to be six. It does not, right? So thinking about that and the graphic that you saw and thinking about the question of greater flexibility and I'll ask quite pointedly, because we're going to talk about it later, no matter what, do PRDs have to be six acres? Can these ideas of flexibility apply to smaller lots? What do you think of in the developments that you've seen or the questions you've had about development that you think merits greater flexibility? Or what are the limits of greater flexibility? Because it says we want greater flexibility. That's why we have a PRD. So what should it be and what shouldn't it be? You didn't think these were going to be hard questions. Did you? <laughs> there is actually an example of that type of subject you're mentioning, that is the development of Tangley Oaks. People came to ARM to, to decide when deciding Tangley Oaks, what was the density they were willing to accommodate for that piece of land. And so the density as related to the spirit of a town, what should it look like was the argument. Now, when you look at that argument, um, that's a different argument for Armour Woods. That's a different uh, argument for <laughs> different, uh, even though they actually kind of look the same, but they're not the same. And so the question is, uh, what is the density we're willing to stand behind that represents like, that represent like that? And that's the, the, that you. question then leads into the question, what can we accommodate? That's really the density question. As a village from an infrastructure and schooling standpoint, what can we accommodate? Because the uh, number that was greenlit years ago um, may no longer be feasible. And so from a feasibility standpoint, if we're looking at smaller pieces of property and density, what can we accommodate given what we know we also have on our plate uh, in terms of, of infrastructure in particular. But I would just want to circle back to what 
Joy said, because that is absolutely probably the, the question is, who is it exactly that we are making these agreements with and what is their portfolio? Because uh, I've represented a nationwide builder and they're building on former farmland tracks of hundreds of acres. So are they interested in developing a 32 acre parcel? Mm, that might not be in their wheelhouse. So where that's a, that's a small niche area building on six acres. Hold that thought, acres. you're right at my next question. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else have flexibility? Can I, I just wanted to say that, so if a developer approached the PCCBA with a strong development, and I think we had one, lots of experience, success in another community right next door, and you know, encouraging, why talk about flexibility, wouldn't it be lovely that we could be a board, both of us, and we could talk about flexibility of how to make the quality of materials better you know, not just listen to the uproar of, of a few people, but the whole community. How do we bridge that gap with flexibility when we have a good developer that may be in our midst and we perhaps missed an opportunity because we weren't flexible enough? Um, and I think that's, you know, encouraging, enhancing the project. I think being reactive to a group opposing how to be proactive versus reactive, I think that's what I hope to achieve in really understanding this, and we try to stay open with, with that, because a developer, if he knows that we wanna build something together and be flexible, maybe that could be an end result, or they walk away because it's too hard, you know, as, as what's happened in the past and, and not feasible financially, um, because it's an expensive proposition for anyone to do right now. And, probably won't have this opportunity again, but if we do, how can we be flexible? And, and maybe maybe this, um, what we're doing right now, this collaboration, when we have, when we have large, um, when we have a, a PRD that's, in, or a, a developer that's coming in front of us with something that's very important and would make a big change to the village or what have you, and we know that uh, community members are going to have opinions and what have you. Maybe this collaboration right here, a kind of an open forum collaboration with these two boards would benefit us because mm -hmm. you have more, you just, there's more conversation and more ability to compromise on where we're going with that kind of development rather than um, you all sitting on your board making comments and coming to us and us making comments. Maybe this collaboration is, is um, would be more beneficial in the future. Mm -hmm. Like we started out asking about six acre minimum and we haven't really talked about it to me that's I mean, we went to density and you know all these other things which are great topics but six acres i don't know how that was decided that it would be a good number but perhaps there are smaller parcels outside of what has been outlined and do we want to just limit it to six acres plus or part of that flexibility might be any size, you know, because we have multifamily lots, we have, you know, we have, we have all kinds of things that haven't been really developed. So do we want to talk about it being six, six acres, that's it? Or do we want to say Thoughts on that point? Drew, do you know the history behind the six acres? Um, I, I don't, I, I would say that it probably is just part of I, what I can tell you, the history of the PRD ordinance that's on the books was I think handed to the village by a developer when they created Tingley Oaks and said, this is what we need to facilitate our development. And it, it, and it was adopted checked all then. those boxes without any extra relief and gave them the development tool with the single PRD uh, being awarded and that's all they needed. So we could so, we could change it to a smaller number if absolutely. we wanted. Absolutely, and even the code today, there's a process to, you know, to absolutely. use smaller lots. But I think right. the idea is how flexible do you want to be? So Easy. let me ask the question, and maybe we'll do it quickly with a show of hands or a couple of nods. Is if we turn this into a more flexible, more creative, more doing what you want it to do kind of district, could you see value in being able to apply that kind of creativity and all these other things to smaller lots? Or no, Michael, it should be bigger lots. 
smaller lots. I'm seeing people nod that smaller lots is not a bad thing. To smaller, like an infill development on the 300 block of East Prospect? I'm not naming names, but well, smaller, I'm just, I'm just yes. it out there, right? The idea, like thinking about like, the heritage lots we've talked about in the past. I will, I, and I usually don't do this, but I will share some of my experience in Highland Park, which is there are times where things come before you that you kind of like, that you wish you had a little more flexibility, that your code keeps you from making better, that you would really like, that if it's a five and a half acre lot, you can't use this to right. so get relief, I know. Um, right, and there's all sorts of things that, that can do, but if we're gonna make this part of the purpose statement and we're gonna look for creativity, I'm gonna come back and tell you that you ought to be able to apply creativity to less than six acres. Let's just get that out there. And if well, that's, that's a problem, yes. maybe tell me now. I, well, I agree. Can we, can, we, can we apply relief? Like if someone came to us and wanted to do something on three acres and they came in front, in front of the board and said, I'd like to do this on three acres, we can approve that. We can, we can, we can apply relief to that. You could do it that way, yeah. But the, the, the <laughs> predictability. Peter. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is what's process. the tension? Relief means <laughs> an, a public hearing, mm -hmm. which is a delay, which is, you know, unknown. It, it's right. an unknown. The fact that you've got it in front of you, no relief is, you know, if we're trying to be attractive, I'm, I'm going to, and, 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 and I'm not right. And I'm not trying to get too far ahead of ourselves, especially given the time. Um, but the size of a, of a PRD shouldn't really be the, con the controlling factor of whether or not it's working for you. Look at all the other stuff we've been talking about for over an hour now. Yeah. That's what ought to control what you're doing with it and how it's helping you continue to, to build your community. It shouldn't be how big it is. And if for some reason six turns out to be right, I don't imagine that it would, well, then that's fine. <laughs> and yet maybe it is. And, and the question is. is, what and is the tension between flexibility, which seems attractive and yet can't be for perhaps the people living immediately next door? Exactly. That's so that it's predictability easy to make that argument and, and until it's about. happening right next to you. So I think that there's something to be said for the very first thing you said, which is zoning equals predictability. And don't we as bodies owe it to the people that live here to provide them with that uh, since they made the investment in Lake Bluff before we haul off and make changes that could yep. have negative ramifications. And I'll tell you quickly, the next step is we will come back to, with a, a memo or report to you to talk about some findings and some directions and you all will do just this. You will use my very words against me to say, <laughs> no, don't do it that way. But, but that's, that's, the part of, that's part of the process, right? That's exactly how it's supposed to work. So this is, this is a great discussion. This will be our, our launching off point for, for further steps. I want to do two things. I want to ask if um, any of our neighbors or any of the folks that are uh, virtual have any thoughts about this notion of flexibility. And then I have four other questions and I'm only going to ask you two of them. I guess, Michael, if I could interject, I, I just want to uh, reemphasize Kate's point with respect to the reliance that the neighbors have on certain parcels and the fact that there could be an inadvertent adverse impact if we, on the neighborhood if we reduce that from six acres to some other size. So this idea of preserving predictability. I think that, that's almost invaluable for the landowner. I really will do this in about 10 minutes, I promise. So a couple more questions and I would ask you to go to your, your um, the list that we asked you to make about what do you need, right? As recommending body, final decision body, um, you need to have, part of my other stick about zoning is um, the purpose of this process is to give you all what you need, the confidence and the comfort level to make the hard decisions that you make, right? So that's why this, what do you all need thing is in here. Um, and, and by the way, let me just say, first of all, excellent discussion, can't thank you enough. It doesn't end here. There will be further discussions. If there is something that you think of driving home, you're like, oh, I should have told, please email it to, to Drew or Glenn or somebody and, and don't, don't stop the conversation here. So let me ask you the, the two final questions in the seven and a half minutes that, that we have left. One, those of you that have been here for various developments or various sizes um, where developers have come before you with a, with a proposal, I have a question and I, and I should tell you too, we, we did a series of, of key person interviews. I talked to a bunch of folks that are um, from the village and from outside the village and they helped share some of their experiences and whatnot. All those conversations are confidential. Um, and a lot of what 
led to my questions for you here tonight grew out of what I heard there, effectively looking to test with you, the community's decision makers, some of the things that, that I heard. Um, but one of the questions that came to me is, in talking to, to some of the developers is, do they understand Lake Bluff? You've all shared some really interesting notions about the community. Mm -hmm. When people come before you with a development idea, do you go, they get us? Or do you wonder if they've ever even driven around town? Michael, can I ask a clarifying question? In the other communities you work with, Highland Park, are there stated uh, objectives uh, for development uh, strategies that that help developers get a better idea of what's going to be accepted and not? Boy, what a great question. Yeah, it's not necessarily in the zoning ordinance, quite frankly. It's usually in the comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, or a, a sub area plan that you've got for the downtown or the area out of Keegan, right? Some policy document should say, here's who we are and here's who we wanna be. The zoning ordinance is the regulatory aspect of it. There's some of that in your comprehensive plan. You know, there's not a ton, but that's usually where it happens. Where I work with a community and our charge is the zoning ordinance, we try and put some of this in here, right? So I've written zoning chapters that start with how to use this chapter um, to try and convey some of that. So, sorry, I was kind of a long answer, but. Yeah, no, that helps because it, it taught greater flexibility and then at the end it says advantageous to the village. Well, let's let's articulate what, what the village right. is. So do, they, so do the developers understand that or do you all and you all, I know staff does, do you all explain it to them? I mean, ideally we, personally, I hope that they did their work and their research before coming before us. Not hopefully, the ones you see, the ones that have been before you, do they get it? And I'm allowed to ask the question because when I write proposals to communities, when I write a proposal to this community, we don't even think about writing a proposal unless we learn something about the town. I think honestly, only Elliot and Gary and Barbara have ever seen anything, just been around long enough to see a development of any note come through. Okay. You know, the, it's actually a really good question you're asking because we don't represent the community for what's going to happen next in the community, but the developer community actually creates for us what we think is the community. Right. So, for example, my first house in Lake Bluff on Washington and uh, uh, Moffett, uh, in a span of five years, I got nine houses built around me, and those were spec houses. Did it represent Lake Bluff? I don't think so. Um, now, Ed Digan has a very specific style that is very reminiscent of the, the first community that was built here. So it really, it has, um, it has a, a style that is um, interesting. Lynch, uh, Jeff Lynch is, it's very creative, it's beautiful, it's, it has the style. And so, but what is, I mean, I don't know how to define it, but people create it for, so we should be objective about it. That's an excellent point. Thank you. Michael, I think the, the, I think it's hit and miss. I think some developers come and, and get it, whether that's because they're local and they've been around and they've watched and so they understand what's happened before and, and what's likely to happen again. There's no question that developers that are not from around here have had a checkered past <laughs> and present. Um, and, and I don't know whether that's, I think, um, I think part of, I, I don't think that's because of something that is or is not in our zoning code or comprehensive plan. Um, I think sometimes they felt like they had a good plan and, and it's, and what guided them was more kind of word of mouth, unofficial talking to people in the village and gave them an idea of whether it was good or bad. And sometimes that kind of input is accurate and turns out to be helpful. But sometimes it's just not complete or it's inconsistent or it's, it, or it's just wrong. So it's, it has been inconsistent. Excellent, those are, those are good points. Oh, please, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I think, I think the one, and uh, to what Regis is saying too, I think that they do come frequently with a product they think we don't have right now. You know, at least lately, some have proposed ideas for a kind of housing that doesn't exist right now or that they think for which there'll be a market. 
for right or wrong. Uh, but they're trying to fill a void and hoping it will fly. And to that point, um, we need um, um, people are willing to retire and stay in this community. Do we have housing, housing stock that fits that need? No. Yeah. no. And do we need to develop that housing stock? Yes, we do. Will it happen? I'm not sure about that, but we do need it. Um, we actually have a lot of it in my neighborhood, in our neighborhood. Um, they're small houses. The problem is that they're being torn down and replaced by houses that are three times their size. So we actually do have, I have a 99 year old neighbor. She lives in a ranch house across the street from me and she can live and stay in place, age in place because the house is small, manageable, affordable, and it's one, one story. Um, but unfortunately, it will probably be torn down and replaced by something too big for the lot. Uh, so part of it is the problem is that we are, uh, that's happening to us by the same people that are coming saying, oh, we'll put this in its place. Won't it be so much better? And so we are, cre it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You can't have it both ways but that's their right. You can't have it both ways. You can, oh, we don't have that housing stock. We have multifamily housing on North Avenue in Washington. People may not like the way it looks, but, it, it, but it's their there. apartments. So it's not fair to say we don't have that because we do. So we have that housing stock. It's just whether or not it's aesthetically appealing to people, which I think is the wrong question to ask. It's what what is it, where is it, and how is it serving the community? But um, I, I think that sometimes it, we look past that. The question is when developers come here, they'll also say, well, this worked somewhere else. So why don't you guys <laughs> like it? Well, the fact that it worked next in the village, the, the, the community next door or a few minutes away by train doesn't mean that it's appropriate for Lake Bluff. So that's often what I've, I've heard because I've participated not as a trustee, but as just a resident. And I, I seem, seem to recall hearing that. And, and I'll, I'll say this one more time, and I mean it quite sincerely. This has been a, an outstanding conversation. As you think of things, send them to staff. They'll send them to me. I have my one more question because it's not, eight, it's only 829, so I get to at least start the question, and you'll, you'll <laughs> indulge me this because it's an important one, and we will come back to it. In this process of reviewing and considering development, as you do and then you do um, in, in the, through the, the zoning ordinance, What's the role of the public in all of this? In 30 seconds. Again, we'll talk about this more later, but I, I would very much welcome your thoughts initially on it um, because it's, it's an important role and it's different in every community. And I was, so I would ask you in terms of all this stuff that we've been talking about, what, what are the role, what is the role of the residents and current business owners in Lake Bluff in terms of this whole process? No, this is this is their community so the, the decisions that we're making we, we represent them up here and I, I guess um when it comes to these big decisions and how we're changing land and how we're using land i would i would love it if if more people were involved and we had we had more public comment this is this is their town And I think that's what the community wants. More, most importantly, we're coming. Yeah, our, our community is. It, we're we're blessed with a lot of invested voices. And what I think we all heard this recent election cycle was the community wants to be invited in, that wants transparency and wants to be involved and have their voices heard. some of the people that don't speak up. There's so many people in this community that have strong opinions and strong ideas. Like Kate, you mentioned, oh, the small houses are going away. But we can also look at it as, but perhaps they're adding on because they want to put an elevator on and they want to live in the home they live in and they have to do something more to be able to stay in our community. It's not necessarily taking down something or removing something that could be a negative. And I think our community is really about a variety of voices and it's not necessarily 
the people that are talking in opposition that we need to listen to the people that aren't speaking and how do we bring those people to the table? That's such is a, really a such a crucial question, right? Joe, I mean, huge. It's, yes, it's a big one. Mm -hmm. Well, our job is to, to encourage people to advocate for their positions. So when people talk to me, I say to them, write a letter to us as a collective. Um, it's one thing to just speak to one of us, to, to talk one-on-one, -on -one, but it's our job uh, to, as fiduciaries, as advocates, to encourage people to advocate for their positions so that we can hear them. Because Joel's right, now, and, and we have to remember, not everybody uh, is comfortable standing at the podium. Right. Um, I've been doing it for years, but that doesn't mean that everyone else feels good about doing that or wants to, but most people don't have a problem putting <laughs> pen to paper. No. And so I think our, one of our jobs is to encourage people to do that, if nothing else, or to email so that we can get that. But I, I worry a lot about um, us and the way that we sometimes tend to characterize people who uh, do appear and have strong opinions. Um, we have to make sure that we are not um, uh, creating more problems than we solve by labeling people. Um, but I agree with Taryn. We, we just want to make sure people feel comfortable being here. To that point, um, to that point, we have many people online and we have also people present in this room, not trustees or board members. So do we have people online uh, who would like to add to this conversation? Susie? Oh, yes. I was just going to say, <laughs> um, as much as I hate to uh, admit it, I am a senior citizen. <laughs> um, I've lived in Lake Bluff 50 years, and um, I've watched a lot of different um, development, you know, tear down, rebuild, yada, yada. But um, I... I find that since my house is paid for, I can stay in a five bedroom home for as much as it's gonna cost me to sell it and buy a smaller home in this market. So that's kind of disconcerting to me um, that you know, when all this settles down, it might be more convenient for me to do that. But I, I would love to have a smaller house and I keep watching, but I just think that it would be nice to, on some of these larger pieces, to have smaller homes for the grandparents who wanna stay where their kids are without living in their pockets. Is, is there anybody else who's listening on, on Zoom? I'd like to share something virtually about the discussion tonight? Doesn't appear so, Mike. So, and again, what about in um, the audience? Do you do we have more comments? Okay, I'm sorry. Can you use the microphone, Jill? Can you handle the microphone, please? Thank you. Thanks. The uh, one particular parcel that is like a dog worrying a bone is Stonebridge, uh, and it's been talked about in this location for years and years different uh, participants. And uh, it would be nice if we could find someone who would actually do something with that land. Uh, lots of the forested area has been totally demolished. Uh, I don't know what the, the zoning was when the original developer did all that, but it's, um, you know, we were spinning our wheels all the time. And I think if we can come up with something that um, is workable for a developer, uh, it would be good to move ahead. Thank you. If there's no other final comments, I would just one more time say thank you for your time. Thank you for your indulgence in running over a little bit. Um, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, members of the PCZBA and the Village Board, 
Um, this is the start of the process of us doing this together. Uh, there are a couple of more chances for us to sit together and uh, think through some more pointed questions based on what I've, I've heard from you tonight and based on what uh, we've, we've read and reviewed and some of the things I've seen elsewhere and tried. So um, I thank you very much for your time. I wanna thank um, the staff, especially um, Drew and Glenn for making all this happen and uh, all they've gone through to, to get me and get our firm smart enough to stand before you and, and ask reasonably, I hope, intelligent questions. Uh, so thank you all for, for that feedback and that input. And we're very much looking forward to taking the next steps with you all. So um, thank you and, and have a good night. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. So I'm very curious to, um, to, um, to, to see what the next step will be. And I'm very, I look forward to what will happen next. Can I please entertain a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Um, clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Brianne. Aye. Trustee Fisher. Aye. Trustee Marquis. Aye. Trustee Rappin. Aye. Trustee Ryder. Aye. Trustee Inkman. Aye. Thank you very much. You know, we're going to do that.